Right. So, the last time we talked about uh, the properties of uh, particle diffusing while in the presence of a magnetic field and we saw that the different components of the velocity of this particle were uh, correlated to each other and we also saw that the diffusion coefficient in the direction of uh, in the direction transverse to the magnetic field was uh, reduced from the normal free diffusion coefficient. Okay. Now, let us turn to the problem of uh, the analysis of noise in general and I would like to introduce various kinds of noise, but we need some tools to understand this. So, for a while let us look at some general formalism. I would like to introduce concepts like the power spectral density and then the Wiener Kinchin theorem and so on which help us analyze noise in general without any specific reference to whether the process is Markovian or anything like that. Okay. Now, um, one of the key uh, tools in this kind of analysis is uh, the exploitation of the fact that uh, noise in general under suitable conditions is stationary that you have a stationary random process and then a great deal of simplification occurs. If the process is not stationary, it is genuinely uh, non-stationary, then what one does is to look at it in windows of time where it is essentially stationary and then approximately you can uh, assume the process to be stationary and go through with the formalism I am going to uh, develop now. So, let us first uh, look at what uh, this entails, what is meant by the power spectrum of a noise. Uh, the power spectrum. Okay. Now, we have in mind in the simplest instance some random process as a function of time which is uh, noisy random. So, it is uh, got a very very uh, irregular time dependence and for uh, to be specific let us call this noise x of t or xi of t for instance easier to write x x of t a random process and we will assume it to be stationary. Okay. Then one could ask if you plot this x of t in a typical realization as a function of time you plot uh, x of t function of time you are going to get some uh, highly irregular curve. We saw in the case of Brownian motion it was so irregular it was not differentiable anywhere, but in other cases the process could be differentiable for instance, but in any case it is unpredictable in some specific sense because it is noisy. Okay. Now, one would like to first of all to understand an irregular curve like this based on our experience with very complicated curves in uh, which occur in sound for example, is to Fourier analyze the whole thing and ask what do the Fourier components look like, what is the frequency content of this noise. But this is not always trivial because this function needs to be absolutely integrable before you can have a Fourier transform. So, it is possible that uh, the Fourier transform of x of t does not really exist in that sense. On the other hand, we have a much more powerful tool which is the autocorrelation of this function of this random process and that is a much smoother function as we have seen function of t. So, what you do is to take uh, x of t naught, x of t naught plus t the product and take its average over all realizations and then this if it is stationary is a function of t in general expected to die down as t becomes very large. Mm. Now, we will assume that all this process has 0 average. So, it simplifies the writing of the formulas otherwise I would have to subtract out the mean each time and write correlation functions. So, we would like to look at uh, a correlation function like x of uh, t naught x of t naught plus t and if it is stationary this is of course, equal to x of 0 x of t. And we could ask what does the Fourier transform of this tell us in principle. Okay. Now, it turns out that there is a very deep connection between what the process itself does and what the Fourier transform of the correlation function does these two. This is the content of the so called Wiener Kinchin theorem which I will write down. We are not going to prove it rigorously, but I will motivate it and we will go through some of the steps to see what is entailed. So, what one does is to take this thing and look at it over a long period of time. 
Okay. So, if you took uh, at various instants, so here is 0 to t some long instant of time, you look at it at various instants of time. So, this is t 1, this is t 2 and so on and compute e to the power i omega t i at those instants of time multiplied by x of t i. You have sampled it at those instants of time times some infinitesimal interval of time around it in this fashion and you sum over this i equal to 0 to n. and let n become very large and take the average the mod squared of this quantity. So, that it becomes real and take its average 1 over t 1 over let us put a 2 pi also. So, it become limit as t tends to infinity. So, consider this. So, I am trying to do a kind of Fourier transform. What I am doing is weighting this with e to the i omega t i multiplying by the time interval and summing all these pieces together. Okay. Of course, this thing here is also equal to limit. In the limit in which these intervals become infinitesimal become 0 10 to 0 you have this is 1 over 2 pi t interval 0 to t d t e to the i omega t x of t mod square. Okay. So, this is a function of omega. Now, let us try and see what this function gives us and what it is going to become equal to. It will turn out and this is the Wiener Kinchin theorem that this quantity is equal to the Fourier transform with respect to time of this correlation function. So, that is our target we would like to establish this that that limit will turn out to be this one the Fourier transform of this quantity here. Okay. But this thing here is defined as the power spectrum. So, this uh, limit whatever it is is equal to by definition the power spectrum of this random variable s x and it is a function of omega. and we will see what information it contains. Okay. Pardon me? Infinity. Should not that be? T tends to infinity. Oh, I am sorry. Yeah, T tends to infinity. Sorry. Of course. Sorry. So, let us see how this arises. Okay. Now, the proof is subtle. It is not a trivial theorem. It is subtle, but we are going to slur over the important part of it, the part that is really requires a little bit of justification. We go through just the algebraic manipulation, but it will motivate how this result arises to start with. So, we will look at that integral, but before that a couple of uh, properties of this uh, thing here of this correlation function. So, let me call this uh, phi of t phi x of t to show that it is for the variable x. In fact, we are soon going to have uh, different random processes here and here, okay. different components say of a vector random process for instance. So, I need a little better notation, but I'll, when I come to it we will be careful. So, this is equal to x of 0, x of t, but notice also that because of stationarity I can add a t 0 to the argument say without changing anything or I can subtract any amount without changing anything. So, this is also equal to x of minus t x of 0 if I just subtract t from the argument of each of the time uh, each of the time arguments right. But this is x of 0 x of minus t if these are classical variables if they are quantum variables if they are operators then we have to be very careful. There is a formalism which will tell you what this uh, the correct answer is you cannot commute these things randomly. But uh, the fact is these are classical variables at this level and therefore, this is equal to phi x of minus t. 
So, the first piece of information we have is that in the simplest instance of a scalar process single component stationary process the autocorrelation function is a symmetric function of the time. Okay. This is why when we computed it for the velocity in a line of one component in the one component of the velocity for a Langevin particle we found e to the minus gamma modulus t for the correlation it is a symmetric function ok. We are going to exploit this as we go along. If you have more than one component of course, then the symmetry property becomes a little more complicated and we will come to that in its time ok. So, let us look at what this S x of uh, omega becomes uh, equal to the limit part I will omit and let us just look at the integral let us look at that thing alone. So, you have 0 to t d t 1 e to the i omega t 1 integral 0 to t d t 2 e to the i omega t 2 with a minus sign because I want the complex conjugate of that x of t 1 x of t 2 that is what this quantity is this modulus squared is equal to that. Okay. Now, a whole sequence of manipulations uh, first of all I can also write this as integral 0 to t d t 1 0 to t d t 2 and then x of t 1 x of t 2 ok. No averaging or anything like that is being done I am just sampling the time series as we go along here times e to the i omega t 1 minus t 2, but this is a symmetric function of t 1 and t 2 right and this quantity is real. So, the imaginary part must vanish identically and indeed it does because the imaginary part is sin t 1 minus omega time uh, t 1 minus t 2 that will be odd under the interchange of t 1 and t 2 and it will vanish ok. So, that is a trivial statement this is cos omega t 1 minus t 2. right it is a real quantity. So, the imaginary part must vanish identically ok, but you can also write this because it is symmetric under t 1 and t 2 and the range of integration is symmetric 0 to t in each of them you can write this as twice the integral from 0 to t 1. And then the next step is obvious change variables to from t 2 to t 1 minus t 2. So, let us put uh, set t 1 minus t 2 equal to t prime. So, d t 2 equal to minus d t prime. So, this guy is twice integral 0 to t d t 1 integral and when t 2 is t 1 it is 0 and when it is 0 it is t 1. So, it is again 0 to t 1 d t prime x of t 1 x of t 2, but t 2 is t 1 minus t prime right. Uh, correct me if I am making a mistake we have to be careful it is t 1 minus t prime cos omega uh, let us set that equal to t it is easier because it is going to come out on the left. So, t 1 minus t cos omega t simplifies the notation ok. Now, let us interchange the order of integration and what is this going to be if I interchange the order of integration. this is equal to twice integral well t 1 runs from 0 to t and t prime runs from 0 to t 1. So, if I interchange t prime will run from 0 to t and t 1 will run from sorry not t prime d t t to capital T ok. So, this is going to be 0 to t d t integral t to capital T d t 1 
x of t 1, x of uh, t 1 minus t cos 1 minus t. Okay. And now, the obvious thing to do is to change because of this thing here change variables to t 1 minus t. Right. So, let us put uh, t 1 minus t equal to t prime. So, d t 1 equal to d t prime. So that is equal to twice integral 0 to t dt integral where does this go t 1 is t. So, this is 0 and capital T minus t dt prime uh, x of t 1 minus t is t prime and then x of t 1 is t prime plus t. Oh, we forgot the cos, cos omega t. So, it is there. Okay. So, which is uh, twice integral 0 to t d t. Let us pull out this cos omega t because it does not involve t prime and then an integral 0 to t minus t d t prime x of t prime x of t prime plus t. Okay. Now, look at what is emerging. You have got precisely the structure that you need for the correlation function if it is stationary because it is saying take any instant of time t prime and take x at that time and x at time t prime plus t staggered multiply the two and keep doing this summing over all t primes. Okay. And this is the step which requires rigorous justification that if this random process has this property of ergodicity namely it takes on all the values in its available sample space given enough time an infinite number of times over and over again then the time average of that integral is equal to the ensemble average over some prescribed distribution over a distribution for the stationary variable which we have not specified. So, this property is known as ergodicity. Let us write it down. Time average over a very long time in the limit t tending to infinity tends t tends to infinity to ensemble average. This is at the root of equilibrium statistical mechanics if you think about it because it says that long time averages of the system given enough time all the accessible microstates are accessed by the system and the average over all of them is equal to an ensemble average over some prescribed uh, distribution which you have to find. So, what is actually being done what you actually measure in experiments are averages time averages. What you compute using the rules of statistics or statistical mechanics are ensemble averages and the article of faith is that one is equal to the other this requires proof rigorous proof and it is the property of ergodicity. In the context of random processes you have to specifically check that this is true in a given instance that the property that this is that the random process is indeed ergodic. This is possible to do once you know a little bit about the statistics of the process you can do it we are not going to prove it we are going to assume that this is true and then this quantity limit t tends to infinity 1 over t integral 0 to t dt prime x of t prime x of t prime plus t is indeed equal to this quantity is equal to the ensemble average of this quantity x of t prime x of t prime plus t. Okay. 
that is the property of ergodicity that we, that we are using. Okay. Then of course, the power spectrum reduces it becomes we have done a little bit of a slate of hand here I have interchanged limits I have shuffled limits here I have taken the limit t inside here and then said argued that this guy is in fact uh, the ensemble average but this can be made rigorous this is the part that I am slurring over but it can be made rigorous. The fact is that it is physically clear that it is if you ergodicity is valid it is this quantity this integ integration which is a time average because of this is equal to this correlation function here okay. And of course, this thing here by stationarity equal to x of 0 x of t equal to phi x of t that is how we defined this correlation. So, finally, it tells us that s x of omega that we have is twice the integral from 0 to infinity because remember there is a t going to infinity limit here of d t uh, well let us write it out explicitly x of 0 x of t cos omega t. But we already saw that this is a symmetric function this phi x of t is a symmetric function. So, you could also write this as equal to integral minus infinity to infinity d t oh there is a 1 over 2 pi right. So, this is 2 over 2 pi so it is 1 over pi and it is equal to 1 over 2 pi d t x of 0 x of t cos omega t which of course is equal to 1 over 2 pi okay. this is the Wiener Kinchin theorem. Sometimes the, there is a wrong impression that the Wiener Kinchin theorem simply says that the power spectrum is defined as the Fourier transform of the correlation function. No, not true. There is a non trivial theorem here, it requires proof, which again I emphasize we have not given, we have only done some of the manipulations. But it is possible to show that if the process is ergodic and stationary, then the power spectrum defined as that sampling integral squared is equal to the Fourier transform of the correlation function autocorrelation function. Okay. Now, of course, we have assumed stationarity here we have assumed all the properties of ergodicity stationarity etcetera, but it is an exceedingly useful theorem in this form it is very useful either in this form or in this form you can write it either way you like. Let us see what it tells us, what it specifically does. Let us look at some specific instances. So, let us look at uh, our, the Langevin particle, the particle that we talked about, including the, with the Gaussian white noise. So, if you recall, our equation was mv dot uh, plus m gamma v in the one component case hmm, was equal to square root of gamma over square root of gamma times eta of t where this was a delta correlated Gaussian white noise okay. Let us let us call this uh, whole thing let us call this zeta of t okay. Then we know what the correlation of zeta of t is zeta of t is a 0 mean process satisfying zeta of 0 zeta of t equal to capital gamma delta of t. It is delta correlated and I took the strength in here inside here. Okay. So, what is the power spectrum 
of this S xi uh, zeta of omega equal to what is this equal to? All we have to do is to use the Wiener Kinchin theorem, namely substitute it in there and that is it. That is the end of the story, right. So, if I put in here a gamma times delta function at t equal to 0, it just brings out the gamma, nothing else, right. So, this is equal to gamma over 2 pi and remember this gamma was 2 m little gamma k t, the 2 cancels. So, it is gamma m m m gamma k Boltzmann t over pi. And that was it. Now, we could ask what is the power spectrum of the output variable of the velocity itself? What does that look like, etcetera? What is that going to be? So, the output variable has got S v of omega equal to once again this is equal to integral from 0 to infinity or 1 over 2 pi minus infinity to infinity d t e to the i omega t times v of 0 v of t. Right? But we know what v of 0 v of t is in equilibrium we computed it it is k t over m times e to the minus gamma mod t we computed it. So, let us write that down this is equal to uh, by the way you could write this down as twice 1 over pi this guy here. So, it is equal to k Boltzmann t over m pi times d t e to the i omega t e to the minus gamma whatever uh, sorry cosine. Now, once you have written this symmetric part then it is just cosine omega t once you have written it as 0 to infinity it is a cosine. So, this is equal to e to the minus gamma t. So, it is equal to gamma k t over 1 over gamma square plus that is not white noise. White noise is something whose power spectrum is constant because it is delta correlated and you immediately get a constant. This is independent of omega, but this has got a Lorentzian shape in omega it drops down. Essentially what the power spectrum does is to measure the intensity of this noise in a given window about any frequency omega in a small window delta omega about omega tells you how much of the noise if you like how much of the amplitude is intensity is sitting there right. And this says that it drops as a function of omega to the output variable. This is unrealistic because it says it is got the same power uh, everywhere for all frequencies from 0 to infinity which is obviously unphysical. The moment you put a finite correlation time it will drop to something like that. Is there a connection between this and that? There should be because there is a connection between these two variables here. Okay. Now, if you do this sort of closing your eyes do it heuristically and take Fourier transforms on both sides look at what is going to happen. By the way our Fourier transform convention was to say that if you give me a function of t then 1 over 2 pi minus infinity to infinity d t e to the i omega t f of t equal to f tilde of omega that is our Fourier transform convention. Okay. So, it also implies that f of t equal to integral minus infinity to infinity d omega e to the minus i omega t f tilde of omega. So, we will stick to this convention so that these factors remain uh, are, are kept track of carefully. Now, let us look at this equation and kind of take Fourier transforms on both sides see what happens. Then uh, uh, m times v dot. Well, if I write v of t in this form and do v dot, I pull down a minus i omega. So, the effect of Fourier transform is to take the derivative with respect to t and replace it by minus i omega. So, m times minus i omega plus gamma on v tilde of omega is equal to zeta tilde 
of omega or uh, v tilde of omega equal to 1 over m minus i omega plus gamma zeta tilde of omega. The moment you have a relation of this kind in general you have one function relate the Fourier transform of one the output variable related to that of the input variable through a susceptibility of this kind this is the called the dynamic mobility in this particular case. Then the power spectra are related by taking simply the modulus squared of this susceptibility ok. That is a relation which can be proved in some generality. So, let me state here without going through the details that this automatically implies that S v of omega must be equal to 1 over m into minus i omega plus gamma mod squared S zeta of omega. It implies that ok. Now, all we have to do now is to put work backwards and check if this is true or not. Uh, so, is that true? We have already got we already had this guy here s for the velocity was equal to this and now if I take this quantity here this is equal to uh, 1 over m squared gamma squared plus omega squared s zeta. So, is this true? I uh, take s zeta of omega which is this and divide by m squared times gamma squared plus omega squared and I get this precisely this here ok. So, it checks out in this case we, we knew already the velocity correlation, but if I did not know it I can now find it by using this relation. We did this by a long procedure of actually writing down the distribution function for this V, the solution, etcetera, etcetera, found out its autocorrelation. Actually, what we did was to solve the Langevin equation and found the autocorrelation, etcetera, but you do not need to do that. All you need to know is uh, this relation, corresponding relation. So, in more complicated instances where you may not be able to write the explicit solution down so easily, you can still write down what is the, uh, the powers, how are the power spectra related to each other. So, this is a useful trick to write down the power spectrum of the output variable given that of the input variable. There is a name for this thing here. Uh, what is this guy called in engineering parlance? It is a transfer function, it is a transfer function, that is exactly what it is. It is the mod squared of what physicists would call the generalized susceptibility, in this case, the mobility. So, what it is telling you is if you give me a unit applied force of um, frequency omega the steady state response will also be of frequency omega and it will be attenuated by a complex number called the generalized mobility generalized susceptibility which is this quantity. Okay. What happens if you have more than one component now things get a little more tricky we have to be a little careful here. Let us look at a physical example. We actually went through one where we had more than one component. So, there what I do is if you got a whole lot of components of some vector process, I would define S i j of omega. Oh, incidentally, one small property which is easy to understand. Uh, we found that S x of omega was equal to twice integral, let us let us get all the pi factors right. Uh, was equal to 1 over pi integral 0 to infinity dt x of 0 x of t cos omega t and this is equal to S x of minus omega. So, it is a symmetric function of the frequency formally that is a useful piece of information that is one of the symmetries in the problem right. Now, let us look at it in the more complicated case when you have more than one uh, component right. 
So, if you have a thing like uh, S i j uh, of omega equal to 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity d to the i omega t x i of 0 x j of t. The power spectrum now becomes a matrix if i and j run from 1 to n for example, it is an n by n matrix with these elements here and there are all these cross correlations sitting here. We have still assumed the process is stationary. So, the whole this uh, every one of these averages function of the time difference alone. Okay. Then the question is what is the corresponding property out there, but you can see by stationarity the following is true. You can see that x i of 0 x j of t let us call this phi i j of t defined to be phi i j of t, but that must be equal to x i of minus t x j of 0 by stationarity because I stagger the time argument by minus t on either, either side, but this is equal to x j of 0 x i of minus t which is equal to phi j i of t right. Pardon me? Uh, oh, phi j i Yeah, yeah. Of minus t. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So we have this property here, and therefore the symmetric and anti-symmetric parts of phi i, i j of t would would be respectively even and odd in time. Right. So this implies that phi i j of t plus phi j i of t. This is the symmetric part of the tensor phi i j of t and that quantity is even in time as you can see and the odd part is odd in time. Okay. The, the anti-symmetric part of the tensor is odd in time that follows in a straightforward way. Yeah. What we need here is the uh, in this place is the following. So, let us look at S j i of omega equal to 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity dt e to the i omega t. So, let us call this uh, phi i j of t and we'll be done with it phi j i of t, but we just saw that phi j i of t is phi i j of minus t. And let us take the complex conjugate on both sides. So, it is minus this guy here and a minus this guy here. This is real because my x is a real valued random variable, okay. but now I change t to minus t in this integration and this gives me S i j. So, what is the higher dimensional counterpart of this symmetry property of S? This says the power spectrum is an even function of the frequency for a single random variable for a random process, a scalar random process. In the moment you have a multi component process, it says the ijth component or omega sorry function of omega, it says the ijth component of that tensor 
is equal to S j i omega star. So, what does it say about this uh, tensor S i j of omega or this matrix? It is a Hermitian matrix, right. So, this matrix S whose elements are S i j of omega is a Hermitian matrix. And we can write a generalization now of the Wiener Kinchin theorem in this case. So, if you have a we have done this already in one example, let us let us take a look at that instance of it. So, again going to the example of a particle in a magnetic field, remember that we computed for a particle. in a magnetic field B equal to B times some unit vector in the n direction, we found the following. We found that V i of 0 V j of t this correlation function phi i j of t, we had an explicit expression for this quantity here. right? this was equal to what? It was k Boltzmann t over m that is always sitting there e to the minus gamma uh, modulus t that was sitting there too hmm, multiplied by if you recall there was a portion that depended on n i n j and a portion which depended on uh, delta from the Kronecker delta and then there was an anti-symmetric portion. So, this was uh, n i n j plus delta i j minus n i n j cos omega the cyclotron frequency times t minus epsilon i j k n k times sin So, this is the symmetric part in i and j. Hmm? Symmetric under i j interchange and this is the anti symmetric part. Now, what about the time reversal properties of these quantities? We already saw what is going to happen. We saw that phi i j the portion of the symmetric part of this tensor must be an even function of time and the anti-symmetric part must be an odd function of time, right. But that is exactly what is happening. So, this is symmetric or even function of time and that is an even, even function of even function of t and this guy is an odd function. Okay. In the diffusion tensor this portion I stated did not make a the odd portion did not appear at all. Okay. We did not actually derive that formula for the diffusion tensor, but I made it as a statement I said that this portion does not contribute to the diffusion tensor at all it is only phi i j plus phi i j of t plus phi i j of minus t integrated from 0 to infinity hmm, which was equal to the proportional to the diffusion coefficient, but the odd part remains I mean it is sitting there and so on and it will contribute to the power spectrum and to the mobility and so on. Okay. Uh, I have not talked about this maybe I will uh, this will contribute to the so called Hall mobility. So, there is a contribution which is not not the usual current, but the Hall current 
and that portion will make a contribution to it. We have not uh, looked at this in great detail, we have not done, uh, we have not talked about the, the linear response uh, aspect of this particle in a magnetic field, but this also has a physical significance, it is not, uh, it is not useless. So, if you give me a general process, I can write down using the wiener kinchin theorem, I can write down uh, the power spectrum of this process and then it gives me a great deal of physical information. In particular, what it does is this relation that it is equal to the Fourier transform of the correlation function, this quantity here is in fact the response function in linear response theory. So, when you apply an external stimulus and you ask what the response of the system is like, it gets proportional to this thing here. Okay. Now, what linear response theory does is essentially is in the context of statistical mechanics, it is first order time dependent perturbation theory okay. together with the statistics that the statistical mechanics classical or quantum that you need and that is essentially what it is. So, this uh, autocorrelation, this uh, cross correlation function here is in the absence of the external perturbation and that measures the response under the external perturbation to leading order in the perturbation in external force. Okay. So, that is the sort of gist of linear response theory in some sense and this is something we have not specifically talked about. If time permits, we will come back and make a few comments about linear response theory, but I thought that one should know this because the reason is that what we are going to do is to go on to use this power spectrum, the concept of the power spectrum to look at what kind of uh, power spectra are generated by different kinds of noise. Okay. We already have one uh, statement that white noise will correspond to a flat power spectrum and the kind of uh, response we had, the Langevin particle for example, has a Lorentzian power spectrum, goes at high frequencies like 1 over omega squared. Okay. By the way, you are used to this in another language, so let me write that down, point out that is exactly the same thing that we are talking about. Uh, if you look at the uh, resistor R hmm, at a con at some finite temperature, then of course, there is Brownian motion of the electrons and that leads to a, an instantaneous voltage across the ends of this resistor and then there is a fluctuating current. So, one could ask what is the power spectrum of the noise like, what is the power spectrum of the current like and so on. Okay. This is called Johnson noise if you measure the power spectrum of this voltage and there is a relation called the Nyquist relation which tells you what it is. It tells you it is essentially proportional to the resistance and is proportional to the absolute temperature which is why you would like to lower the temperature to reduce this noise here and that uh, comes about very easily because this resistor has always got a self inductance. So, it is like effectively an inductance and a resistance in parallel in which case uh, you have this L. So, you have L d i over d t plus R of t equal to the voltage V of t applied or spontaneous we do not care what right in this fashion. Then uh, this is the same as our problem, our pro earlier problem was m d v over d t plus m gamma v of t was equal to zeta of t and then we found that in this problem s zeta of s zeta of omega was equal to what was it you have to tell me the factors now this is some gamma k t m gamma k Boltzmann t over pi or something like that, yeah with the 2 pi over pi, yeah. So, the correspondence between these two guys is that in this electromechanical analogy is m is this and m gamma is the equivalent of the resistance r, that is the correspondence between the two. So, this immediately tells us uh, that the, this thing will also imply that S the voltage of omega equal to m gamma which is R k Boltzmann t over pi. That is the form in which you are familiar with it in terms of Johnson noise, right. 
No? Almost. Almost. What, what form are you familiar with it? Pardon me? Same form, 4 KT. 4 KT, 4 R KT. 4, the factor 4. Actually, yeah. What happens is the following. Our Fourier transform convention was to say that uh, f tilde of omega was 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity d t e to the i omega t f of t and correspondingly f of t was equal to integral minus infinity to infinity d, d omega e to the minus i omega t f tilde of omega. This one. But the electrical engineers use a convention in which the 2 pi factor sits here 1 over 2 pi and not there. So, an extra 2 pi factor. They also define the power spectrum as twice the Fourier transform. So, there is a 4 pi factor which multiplies this whole thing. So, for them this is not true. It is multiplied by 4 pi this is equal to 4 r. This is surely familiar, right? That is the form in which it is written in textbooks. So, this uh, factor 4 pi is, is there, I mean, it is really there. It has to do with the convention that you choose, plus the fact that you defined it as 4 times the Fourier, uh, twice the Fourier transform, okay. But I just chose the simplest convention. So. And I chose this purely as a matter of convention there is no because this is the one that is most convenient in the usual formalism of linear response theory where you have a one sided Fourier transform with a plus sign here for the generalized mobility okay, or the susceptibility. And if you use that convention then this generalized susceptibility has no singularities in the upper half plane in omega and has singularities only in the lower half plane. So, it was to ensure that that I needed a plus sign here. And the 2 pi was a matter of convention because it corresponds with what is used when you go from spatial Fourier transforms from x to k. So, I just wanted to keep that one. So, whatever it is, you, you have to stick to one convention all the time. So, this is uh, the usual Johnson noise or whatever. There is also other kinds of noise like short noise, um, semiconductor noise of various kinds. So, we will talk a little bit about that subsequently. Okay, so let me stop here today. Mm -hmm.